Should you buy the Ender 3 version 2 3D printer or is there a better option out there for you? In this video I'm going to try my best to answer these questions and also share my experiences of owning and using this printer. I've owned my Ender 3 version 2 for over six months now which is a good amount of time to experience all of the issues a 3D printer might throw at you. I've kept the printer completely standard during this time so the printer I'm reviewing is exactly as it came on day one. This isn't my first 3D printer and I bought this with my own money so that I could create video guides for people new to the hobby on a machine that would be similar to what they were using. I assumed that a budget printer like this would give me lots of issues and I could share my experiences of how to fix them. However, as you'll see, that didn't quite go to plan. The version 2 comes neatly packaged with everything you'll need to get started in one box. While I show you what you get, I'll run you through some of the specs. It has a print area of 220 by 220 millimeters and a print height of 250 millimeters. That's just over eight and a half inches square by just over nine and a half inches tall. It has an aluminum heated bed capable of reaching 110 degrees C. It comes with a PTFE lined hot end that's capable of a 250 degree printing temperature. However, the supplied PTFE tube is only capable of 240 degrees. So we'd need a very simple upgrade to use the maximum temperatures. The version 2 is supplied with a 32-bit silent motherboard. This means that the stepper motors around the printer will be quiet because of the trinomic drivers used, not the motherboard itself. 32-bit may not sound like a lot nowadays, but it's a big improvement over the 8-bit motherboards that are supplied with many printers in this price bracket and gives you some sweet firmware possibilities if you want them. The standard firmware has the essential thermal runaway protection and resume printing feature that means you can continue a print if you have a power loss. There's no filament runout sensor though, so there's nothing to stop the printer trying to print if you run out of filament or it breaks. There are easy adjusters for belt tension, which the earlier Ender 3s didn't have, and there's a single stepper motor and lead screw moving the x-axis gantry up and down. The Ender 3 version 2 is supplied with a Meanwell power supply, which supplies the printer with 24 volts, and there's a color LCD screen with all of the basics laid out in simple menus and controlled with a single knob rather than a touch screen. The version 2 uses a Bowden tube to feed the filament to the hot end from the extruder rather than the direct drive setup on the more expensive Ender 3 S1. This enables a quoted 180 mm per second max speed compared to the S1's 150 mm per second. But don't expect to be able to actually print at these max speeds. They just demonstrate that a Bowden tube fed printer can move faster because of less weight on the X carriage. The hot end takes the widely used MK8 nozzle, so spares are easily sourced. This Ender 3 model is also supplied with a carborundum printing surface that can be flipped over so that a plain glass surface can be used too. Both surfaces are pretty decent and I find the glass bed to be a good improvement over other printers I have with an aluminium bed and an adhesive grippy build tack type surface. The main benefit of a glass bed is the fact that it's usually very flat and doesn't warp when heated and they're usually much more durable. The overall size of the printer is relatively small which enables it to fit comfortably on a desk or workbench. There's also a handy tool drawer in the base to help keep your work area tidy. When it comes to setting up the Ender 3 version 2, there are a couple of potential issues to look out for. This printer comes partially pre-assembled with what is a pretty good manual detailing the assembly steps. However, when assembling mine, I did find a couple of issues that could develop into problems down the line, if not resolved at the build stage. I made a detailed video explaining how to overcome these though, and I definitely recommend you check that out before trying to assemble your Ender 3 version 2. Allow for around an hour to unbox and assemble this machine properly. Once you have your printer assembled, all you need to do is level your bed and warm everything up. Heat up times are adequate, with the 24 volt DC bed being the limiting factor. The Ender 3 version 2 uses a mechanical Z limit switch to find the home position and you manually level the bed from there. For beginners, manual bed leveling, or tramming as it should be called, is definitely the simplest way to start. I have a video detailing how to do it on the Ender 3 version 2 and once you've done it a few times it becomes second nature. Many printers, including the more expensive Ender 3 S1, say that they come with auto leveling, which can confuse a lot of beginners. When you use a machine with a CR touch, BL touch, or other kind of probe mounted to the hot end, the bed isn't automatically leveled. All that happens is the printer probes different areas on the bed and uses this information to move up and down to follow any contours on a warped bed or the surface of a bed that's out of level a bit. In reality, you still need to set the bed alignment before the probe does its thing. The mechanical Z limit switch on the Ender 3 version 2 is much simpler to understand, quicker, and in some cases more reliable than other options that will cost you more. So once you have the Ender 3 version 2 assembled and ready to go, how does it print? 
I started by using Cura to slice a file designed to check your bed alignment and loaded up the supplied white PLA filament. While this came out okay, there was a bit of stringing and general untidiness, but this all changed when I loaded up some copper silk PLA that I had dried in my modified filament dryer. The quality was brilliant. Now this wasn't the most challenging test print, but bed adhesion was great. The print was really clean and the printer did everything expected of it. Then I tried another couple of other test prints that I like to do with a benchy and a calibration cube. I won't go into great detail on measurements, but suffice to say that the prints were so close to being dimensionally correct that there were no adjustments necessary. Over the following months, I completed a large number of different prints and I've always been very happy with the results. The only changes I made to the standard Cura profile was to actually decrease the retraction settings a little, as I was getting some small gaps in print walls after a retraction. At the time of recording this review, there's still no specific Ender 3 version 2 printer profile in Cura Slicer, but the Ender 3 profile is fine because all of the important bits are the same. I've printed with PLA, PLA+, Silk PLA, PETG, TPU, and had good results with all of them. ABS is potentially too big a stretch, but that's mainly because the standard PTFE tube won't take the heat, and an enclosure is usually needed. So what about all the problems I had with this printer? Well, apart from a cracked tensioner bracket that I haven't actually replaced yet, I haven't had any. I know this might sound unbelievable, but I've had zero other failed components, no major print defects, and no print failures that were due to the printer doing something unexpected. In fact, I very often have to deliberately break the printer to try and recreate problems that other people are having so that I can explain how to fix it. Whenever I try improving print quality by running calibration procedures, I find that the standard setup is very close to what I end up arriving at. If you're not sure yet whether you need all the bells and whistles that come with other more expensive printers, then the Ender 3 version 2 has got you covered. Creality have designed this printer with upgrade potential in mind. There are upgrade kits available to take the specification of this printer virtually all the way to the level of the Ender 3 S1. You can add another lead screw, a BL or CR touch, a magnetic spring steel bed, and even a direct drive kit. There are extra mounting holes where needed, and the motherboard has sockets for the extra hardware. You will need to upgrade the firmware if you add an ABL sensor or filament runout sensor, but this is all done very easily by putting the right files on an SD card that goes in the back of the screen and then your printer. You don't even have to connect your printer to a PC anymore. I'll do a video guide on upgrading the firmware soon, so hit subscribe if you don't want to miss out. Or you can do exactly what I've done and leave the printer completely standard and get great prints time after time. I also run Octoprint on an Android phone with the Ender 3 version 2, with setup and connection being extremely easy. So who would I recommend this printer to? Being completely new to 3D printing is not a problem with the Ender 3 version 2, however the build and setup procedure is best done by somebody with a little bit of mechanical knowledge. I'm not talking engineer level, but a little bit of mechanical sympathy can go a long way with this printer. If you're someone who might look at taking a push bike to a repair shop if the chain came off for instance, then unfortunately you may need to look at spending a little bit more to get a printer that needs a bit less tinkering at the beginning. I'll follow all of the Facebook groups and some subreddits for the Ender 3 version 2 and try to help people out as much as I can with any issues. I find that 90% of the problems people have can actually be traced back to the mechanical setup of the printer itself. Luckily for you, you've found my channel where I have many videos covering most, if not all, of these little potential issues and how to avoid them. On the positive side, the Ender 3 version 2 has a powerful control board with huge upgrade potential. The glass and carbon and print surfaces give you a nice durable flat bed to get your prints off to a great start. A well-built machine gives awesome print quality and you can use a wide range of filaments. I also think that the version 2 is much better looking than some of the earlier Ender 3s with less of a DIY vibe, but some of the cable routing could be a bit better. When it comes to the naughty list, there aren't many entries, but some of them may be significant for you. Whilst the stepper motors are whisper quiet, it doesn't really matter that much because the fans are so noisy. I don't know why Creality have overlooked this area after investing in the quiet stepper drivers for this machine. But unfortunately, without replacing the fans, I wouldn't recommend sitting this machine next to you on a desk while you're working. Another frustrating thing, this time about the screen and firmware combination, is the lack of visibility of the file names on the SD card. You only get to see 14 characters, which means you need to be very selective about how you name your files and make sure all of the important bits are at the beginning. Personally, I like to have material, nozzle size and print time, along with some kind of distinguishing name for each of my files, and fitting all of this into 14 characters is next to impossible sometimes. 
There are different firmware options which solve this problem though, which I'll cover in another video. The single lead screw also means that your roll attention and gantry level need to be spot on if you want consistent alignment. Dual kits are available though, and this problem is common across any printer with only one lead screw controlling your Z height. Many people have had the extruder arm crack, which causes under extrusion and a lot of head scratching, but I haven't had this issue myself. Again, upgraded aluminium ones are easily sourced and swapped out if you do have this problem. In my opinion, the Ender 3 version 2 hits that sweet spot of affordable printer that is capable of producing fantastic quality, is easily upgraded and has a large community of other people running the same printer. Its only real limitations are its bed size, as almost everything else can be upgraded, and its slightly more complicated build process compared to other similar printers. It's possible to find very similar specs on less expensive printers like the Voxelab Aquila or the BQB1, but the trade-off in my opinion is that because there are less people using those printers, finding solutions to any problems can be trickier. I also haven't used either of those printers, so can't comment on how good they are. To sum up, I'd say the Ender 3 version 2 is a good, solid, reliable printer if it's built right. It comes with a basic specification, but with huge upgrade potential. The only real reason I'd have for recommending a different printer is if you know you're going to need a bigger bed size, or you don't know one end of a screwdriver from the other. I imagine not everybody will have had a smoother ride with this printer as me, so please leave your experiences below in a comment, good and bad. If you'd like to see how involved the build process is for the Ender 3 version 2, then click here or click here for another video you might like. Thanks for watching.